Today's episode is brought to you by Merchant Spring. Vendor performance data at your fingertips. Visit MerchantSpring.io for more information. Hi, welcome, and I'm your host, Paul Sommerfeld, and today I'm joined by Martin Hubel from Consultese. Today we're going to go over uh, the results of an industry-wide survey conducted with over, actually, more than almost 600 first party vendors and the results are interesting because they give us insights into the one piece supplier relationship with Amazon, the annual negotiation process and the future priorities with the online retail giant. Now, of course, to help me do this, I have invited uh, Martin along just to introduce him. Martin founded Consultesa to help B2C household and CPG brands reliably increase their one P vendor profits with Amazon. Uh, prior to starting his consulting practice, uh, Martin had an extensive career with Amazon in Europe. Now, Martin is a regular guest. So, Martin, thank you again for being on the show today. Thanks, Paul, for having me back. It's a pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to kind of discuss exactly what you're talking about, like all of the survey results um, that yeah, I've conducted with over 500 brands and 500 brand representatives of first party vendors. And I think we're going to really yeah, get into the weeds of it and yeah, very much looking forward to it. So thanks, thanks for having me. I certainly, um, as I was promoting the, this episode, I, you know, I think one of the angles I really took, which I, I think is, is really true in the sense that what an opportunity to kind of accelerate your own learnings, you know, not by trial and error doing everything yourself, but uh, you know, looking across the landscape and learning from 500 other vendors uh, simultaneously. So it is a very unique opportunity. Um, before we dive into, you know, the slides and the charts and the insights, love to just get a bit of background. I mean, what, what prompted you to uh, conduct a survey and um, what were the parameters of the survey? Yeah, 100%. Like, look, for anyone who's obviously also tuning in and watching us today, um, I used to work for Amazon. I moved into the role of a self-employed consultant uh, roughly two years ago. And when you're venturing out of such a data-driven company as Amazon, for me, the challenge was oftentimes that I understood the dynamics in the vendor landscape. Um, but of course, sometimes it's a little bit hard to quantify them and to really understand, okay, where's the industry heading um, if you look at the macro and not at the micro level? And especially as a consultant, you know that obviously are very kind of deep into the details of your client's business but what you also want to understand is whether this is kind of a skewed um, reality and you're working too much inside of a certain bubble or whether this actually represents the wider trends that are happening among brands large small and medium sized uh, and this was really the kind of key motivation for me to venture out and uh, to simply ask the vendor representatives that were taking part in this survey around okay what is your quality of the trade relationship with amazon what was the outcome of your most recent vendor negotiation, but then also to really understand um, each and everyone's individual priorities um, in 2024 and beyond. So what are the key big bets that now brands are placing with Amazon in order to foster not only their growth with the online giant, but also, of course, their profitability and profit margins? Because as we will see when we dive into it, this is a key priority in 2023 where profit margins are squeezed anyways. We don't necessarily have very much disrupted supply chains, of course, to a certain extent still. But of course, there are more dynamics that come into play, such as less standing from customers and also a little bit more of a reserved kind of or muted view when it comes to growth ambitions. And uh, you read about these in the news all the time. But uh, what I really wanted to get an understanding of is, OK, is that actually what keeps business decision makers and business leaders up at night? So, Martin, give us a flavor of the types of vendors that are participating. Now, where are they sort of based? More Europe, US, size, categories. Uh, are you able to paint a picture for us? Yeah, 100%. So, very interestingly, um, a lot of the brands that were participating come from the major two regions that Amazon operates in. Um, North American uh, participant accounted for roughly 50.2%. Well, 52.7% of overall respondents. But of course, there's also shared responsibility of a lot of uh, business leaders. So they are not only looking after the North American business, but also, for example, to the European business. Um, so the percentages don't add up to 100% because some have mutual responsibilities. 
72.6% um, of the survey respondents also had um, responsibility for the European markets, whereas then 15% roughly came from and were responsible for the Asia Pacific uh, region, whereas 12.9% for the Latin America um, and roughly 9% for Middle East and Africa. So really kind of a wide spectrum. Of course, it is very much consolidated based also on how Amazon is a key priority for brands when you look at the individual regions. So again, North America and European markets certainly spearheading um, from a survey participant's point of view, um, the overall polls. Um, the seniority was also quite interesting. So we had um, more than 21% of um, C suite and uh, yeah, mid-level uh, decision makers um, that were participating in the overall survey and over 45% were, were senior managers, um, which obviously also gives us a good overview of, okay, where's they headed? Um, and when you look at the overall size of uh, the brands, then almost 40% of all of the survey participants um, reported annual Amazon sales between zero and 10 million, 36% uh, reported um, 10 to 50 million, and over a little bit over 10% of survey respondents um, reported annual Amazon sales between the range of 50 and 100 million US dollars. Um, so certainly quite a, a good representation. Um, the remaining gap is indeed um, almost 14% um, from uh, brands that were making over 100 million uh, US dollars in annual sales volume um, coming from Amazon. Uh, so I think, yeah, we get certainly the kind of representation that um, I was hoping for from small to mid-sized brands, but also the kind of large multinationals that are, of course, becoming more and more a key priority of Amazon in this vendor model as well. Well, it's, uh, I can't wait to get into the insights. Um, before uh, we dive into that, I just want to remind everyone that we are going to have a couple of minutes at the end for uh, Q&A, live Q&A, as we always do. Uh, so feel free to pop your questions in the LinkedIn comment sections and they'll surface uh, right in front of us and we'll try and do our best to uh, to cover them. So um, yeah, back to you, Martin. Um, tell us, what are the, what are, according to you, I mean, you've been in this space for a long time. What were the key, key takeaways for you? What do you find most interesting and intriguing in terms of the data and the insights you were getting back? Yeah, sure. I mean, I would suggest let's just dive into it. Um, we brought the slides of the results uh, with us so we can kind of uh, take a first look at it. And um, I think the key kind of theme that we see in the industry when we talk to decision makers all the time is, of course, this constant question around, shall I only sell via Vendor Central or shall I maybe also have a Seller Central account or sell maybe only on Seller Central going forward? So the question is really 1P, 3P or hybrid? And um, the question in this um, survey was also asking around exactly that. Um, interestingly, um, we have a little bit over half of brands um, that are vendors not selling through Seller Central at all. So they don't actually have their own Seller Central account and they also don't use a third party distributor or logistics provider actively at least um, in order to sell through Seller Central. Of course, they may have other sellers that are third-party sellers and are actually competing with them for the buy box, but this is certainly not intended and not an active decision. And this is certainly very interesting because, of course, when you're on LinkedIn, when you're looking into a certain forums and groups where, of course, also decision makers um, in the vendor space are coming together, then this is a constant top-of-mind discussion point around, okay, shall I go and branch out from Vendor Central or not? Um, roughly a third... Uh, of all brand uh, participants um, indicated that they were a vendor, but they also owned a third-party seller central account. And we will talk about the motivations in a second. But uh, this is certainly interesting because here the brand really decides itself that they want to become active. They want to kind of expand their resources, expand their capabilities to not only sell via vendor, but simultaneously also via seller central. And then a smaller fraction indicated that they are a vendor that is represented also by a third-party logistics provider or distributor via Seller Central. So these were 13.1%. Um, so here you really see, okay, the vendor says, we do not really want to have the hassle of opening our own Seller Central account. We just deploy very actively um, a third-party solution provider for us that is actually selling on behalf of us. 
um, next to our vendor central account on Amazon. And then a small fraction of 2.7% said that they are a vendor that uses both a third party logistics provider or distributor, and they also have their own third party account. So here you have the full blown setup. Um, but it's interesting because we, of course, need to a little bit understand the motivations behind that. And thankfully, we get a good overview when we look at this following chart. Um, when we look at the primary challenges <laughs> that are really encountered by first party brands when trading with Amazon day in and day out. And you see it at the very top, right? I mean, 30% of participants indicated that a lack of communication is really the challenge when working with Amazon. And we see that all the time. It's becoming harder and harder, especially if you're a smaller brand selling on Amazon to have a direct contact with a vendor manager. They may only reach out to you when they want deal funding or when they want to negotiate the annual trading terms with you. And this certainly is also difficult for a lot of brands that are coming from the classic retail space where they know that retailers are typically taking the role of a strategic partner to develop the category and the business together. And then here comes Amazon and says, okay, we want to automate most of those processes and we kind of reduce our communication to you to a minimum. And maybe sometimes only the case system, or if you're lucky enough and you have a subscription to the Amazon vendor service, you have a contact person there to actually dive into all of that. Pricing strategy and competition, uh, so 24.7% of all vendor participants uh, in the survey indicated that this was certainly their first and foremost challenge. Um, and this also kind of indicates a little bit this or refers back to this move of vendors moving and branching out to 3P in the hope of expanding and reducing, of course, also their risk of becoming too dependent on the vendor central model. And especially in correlation to point one, we must obviously keep in mind that if you get less and less resources deployed by Amazon, and on top of that, you have a strategic misalignment when it comes to your distribution setup and Amazon as a price follower, then those are two critical challenges that may prompt a lot of brands to leave or at least to diversify away from their vendor central setting. Um, but again, right, I mean, we need to always take care that the business case is very thoroughly developed. Uh, but it certainly, the service results certainly indicate that, yeah, two of those um, and the first um, two challenges are primary drivers on why you would like to move away. Um, financial disputes, so chargebacks, shortages, co-op deductions, we all know those. Roughly 20% of all survey participants said that, yeah, this is one of their primary challenges. And again, it correlates a little bit to the first point. If you have a lack of communication and you don't get prioritized as a brand, of course, it becomes harder to also get your financial disputes resolved. Because if you are left with only the uh, case system in Vendor Central, we all know that it can be quite a lengthy and dreadful process um, to get that done. And then two more points that were quite interesting, inventory management and forecasting, but also advertising and marketing. So especially on the inventory management and forecasting point, we all know that vendors are very much dependent on this forecast in Vendor Central. And it may not always capture the most accurate kind of reality that we live in, because if you schedule a promotion um, short term, or if you're also kind of um, reducing promotions short term because ASINs become ineligible because of profitability reasons to participate in certain promotional events, such as Prime Day or Black Friday and Cyber Monday, then of course that also creates a lot of volatility and a lot of brand and decision makers perceive that they can own their forecast a little bit better and their inventory management better if they branch out to a third party seller central account simply because then either they own their inventory management entirely or they can at least decide how much of inventory they would like to sell or send um, via FBA to Amazon in their warehouses, at least in certain limits and in a certain framework. So yeah, those are the kind of primary challenges um, that to a certain extent, of course, also correlate with the notion of brands branching out and looking to uh, expand from a vendor setup only with Amazon. I think um, bringing and giving a little bit more context to this, of course, I think this is a trend that we are going to see fostering even further, particularly for smaller brands that don't have a dedicated vendor manager resource um, associated and linked to their account. 
um, because it becomes increasingly harder to manage your vendor business if you do not have a buyer sitting on the other side of the fence. Um, and if you then negotiate only against an algorithm, uh, you may very well, as a smaller brand, at least say, okay, I can deploy my resources that I have more effective and efficiently um, if I move towards a self-service model, um, which is intrinsic to the seller central. Thanks, man. Sorry, I was just trying to bring myself back into the stream. Um, actually, let's leave your uh, let's leave your slides up. Actually, um, the um, I guess this is the first time you've done this, right? Uh, because I'd love to, to see how this this is going to evolve over time. Certainly, there's a yeah. lot of heat in relation to some of these topics. At the start of this this conversation, you man, you you were talking about um, you know. Vendors in different geographies. Uh, I don't know if you've done this analysis or you've sliced it this way, but do you see differences in terms of geographies and priorities and the challenges encountered by Amazon vendors? Yeah. Uh, so certainly I looked at the uh, individual regions. Let's just keep in mind that the uh, sample size of so the participant number of 574 is relatively small, right? So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily representative of the entire uh, vendor landscape. I think that is a little bit of an overstatement. Um, and when we slice it down into the individual geographies, obviously the sample size reduces a little bit more. So take it with a pinch of salt when I say that in general, there were no significant deviations uh, between especially the North American and European kind of um, regions where most participants uh, were coming from. We see at least in the um, mid tail here that of course financial disputes correlated a lot to the vendor size. And that is simply because if you have a larger business with Amazon and you have um, issues of, let's say, only one or two percent of overall financial disputes with Amazon, then, of course, the absolute US dollar or euro amount is also higher. So, of course, the higher it is, the more it becomes a priority. And um, this correlated particularly with this financial disputes point here, but also the um, communication with Amazon, because, again, if you have higher financial disputes, and a lack of communication with Amazon, then those two form the primary kind of concern. Um, and you saw that not necessarily region by region, but particularly when you compared it to the vendor size that those participants came from, that the priorities here shifted significantly, um, but not to the extent that you can really say it's statistically always significant, which is why I left it out in this overview. Yeah, sure, sure. Um... I'm just going back to a webinar that you and I did many months ago about how to get ready for the negotiation cycle in 2023. I think we did it towards the end of Q4 last year. Um, what, what, what are uh, survey participants telling you around the negotiation cycle at the moment? Uh, you know, how they're tracking, uh, what, what, what insights did you glean from how this year is progressing, you know, with all the additional pressures that, uh, that exist this year, perhaps versus prior years, you know, what, what did you see? Yeah, absolutely. I think when it comes to annual vendor negotiations, especially in 2023, a lot of vendors were caught by surprise about the level of firmness or some would call it even aggressiveness that they were perceiving at least from their vendor managers because Amazon didn't necessarily back down from a lot of their R's that they initially placed. And uh, this deviated a little bit from the previous years where a lot of brands were, of course, understanding that Amazon may anchor a little bit higher, but then still over iterations of the negotiation comes down. Um, and this caught, of course, also the strategy that a lot of brands deployed um, by surprise or kind of disabled it entirely. Um, so it's certainly interesting when you look also at the survey results and when we take a look at uh, the initial ones, because the perceptions of most first party brands um, about the annual vendor negotiations this year uh, were quite interesting to uncover. Like almost a third of participating vendor representatives said that AVNs were very challenging and time consuming. 18% said they were unsuccessful or even unresolved, so even sometimes not finished at all, or they were not able to complete them successfully. Again, 18% as well said they were difficult but ultimately successful. Whereas only 17% that they were fairly smooth with some challenges and 12% said they were partnership oriented and collaborative. Only 4%, a little bit lower than 4%, said AVNs were very straightforward and efficient. And this really gives you a good glance into how hard and how difficult it was for a lot of business leaders this year 
to find a mutual ground when both parties, vendors and Amazon at the same time, are prioritizing their bottom line. So wanting to improve their profit margins. Um, whereas in the years before, you either had a very clear focus on Amazon to growth and expansion, such as in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. And then afterwards, also a prioritization of Amazon of availability, because there were so many supply chain disruptions that vendors could freely choose who they would like to allocate their inventory to. Now, these times certainly have changed because now we've seen that Amazon is coming back and completely reprioritizing its retail business away from growth towards profitability. And I mean, if you zoom out, um, I also shared this the other day on LinkedIn in a post, and you look at Amazon's operating margin as a business as a whole, so not only looking at retail or AWS or ads in, in particular, you see that 1.8% of operating margin um, in, in the last year, I think it was in the fourth quarter, is of course concerning not only to shareholders, but also to Andy Jesse as a CEO of Amazon itself. So of course, this kind of sudden shift from growth to profitability is somewhat derived from also the need to kind of recover profit margins for shareholders in order to get the stock price up again. Um, but it is also something that we will or will accompany us um, over the next couple of quarters. I only foresee this profitability focus um, of Amazon to really cease to exist in early to mid 2024. When we look, however, at the next slide, um, and this could be uh, interesting for the audience as well, what was the uh, actual impact of trade negotiations on the first party vendor margins? 36% um, said there was no change in margin at all. Again, almost 36% said there was a decrease in their margin, whereas 21% said there was an increase in their margin. Roughly 7% said they either don't know or they don't prefer to say, which is obviously completely fine. But I think this really it's also gives us a it glimpse. It'll increase in margin, maybe. A, Who knows? 100%. So you actually <laughs> see that, yeah, if, if uh, only 20% of brands are benefiting from annual vendor negotiations in 2023, it's clear that those negotiations and trade discussions primarily serve one object and one object only to improve the profit margin of Amazon. And that is a little bit of a challenge, right? Because it not necessarily motivates a lot of brands to kind of expedite the process of negotiations when the majority of them says that we are actually seeing either no change, so actually we are just wasting our resources in plain English, or we are seeing actually a detrimental impact on our bottom line. Um, and this is certainly something that we need to kind of take into consideration also when we look at our strategies going forward um, because the next slide shows us a little bit on how this impact of these trade negotiations unfolded when we measure it by the length of the negotiations that survey participants indicated. And you actually see that there's not necessarily a clear and firm indication that there is a good correlation between the length of the negotiation and the negotiation outcome. And this is certainly something that vendors should take note of because a lot of business decision leaders sometimes say, Let's just drag on a little bit with the negotiation, have more iterations, because surely our vendor manager eventually will give in. And based on these results, we can actually see that this is not necessarily the case, because an increase in margin was more likely if you kind of prioritized the annual vendor negotiation process. But the longer it dragged on, uh, we actually see that the increase in margin uh, as a result of the AVN was not necessarily um, yeah, a result. So if you negotiate between six and 12 months, only 12.5% of vendor um, participants in this survey said that they were actually increasing their margin. Um, however, 37.5% said there was no change in margin. And the majority here, yeah, over 40% said, okay, there was actually a decrease in their margins. This is not too much different than if you just spent your time negotiating on one to three months, other than that the cohort of no change in margin is deliberately smaller. So the sweet spot really seems to be in prioritizing certainly your vendor negotiations and trying to kind of get them done as quickly as possible. But again, that's also not a guarantee that you will get this result because the distribution between all of those results in the individual time buckets um, is certainly varied. So there's no clear correlation between the length of negotiation and the outcome. Um, but it seems, based on those insights, um, certainly that at least if you're prioritizing it, um, you're 
having the advantage of not binding all of the resources towards these trade discussions. Whereas if you're dragging them on for longer, uh, your teams have to negotiate more. They have to kind of reiterate their discussion points and arguments much more than um, if you prioritize it. And the result of the longer negotiation does not necessarily equal or guarantee also a better result for your company. Very interesting. Uh, it sounds like it, between the three and six months, you've got a fair chance of no margin change. Um, certainly, if you pass the six months mark and uh, you know realign your expectations, I guess is the uh, yeah. the sum of the takeaways here. Um, because then I think you also reach the part where there are often gridlock negotiations happening, right? So no side is able to move back or forth, and then you need to have those senior relationship escalation meetings where you bring in your leadership teams, and Amazon also brings in their superiors, whether it is a senior sales director or whether it is a category leader. Um, I think the key takeaway here is that you really must ensure that whenever you negotiate with Amazon, you can skip at some point at least your vendor manager. And you can only skip him or her if you have at least a loose relationship and know who their manager is. So either the head of vendor management, the category leader of this category, or the senior sales director. If you don't know those names and you don't have their contact details at all, this should form your first priority because then you can expedite negotiations much faster than if you're entirely reliant on your vendor manager that sometimes is not even incentivized to expedite and to facilitate the negotiation progress with you. That's a very interesting insight there. Escalate up, up and down the organization. Um, Escalation is certainly the key to success, right? I mean, Amazon is not unique in that sense. It's also with other retailers. You need to have this escalation path. And uh, the challenge with Amazon, however, is that they are not necessarily willing to give you those details right away. They want vendor managers to own the business relationship. So it is on you as a brand to really facilitate that and to also ensure that outside of the negotiation process. And now is a good time because most AVNs have been concluded that you now kind of request those contacts, maybe have a, a kind of strategy meeting with them, or you at least request that they take some time to kind of review the business together with you, even if that just means that they have a 30 minute catch up with you um, throughout the year. But um, certainly ask for it and also be persistent because you may not get an answer from your vendor manager or a response to this request straight away. Sure, yeah. It creates work on their side as well, right? Now they have to have to prep their line manager and give them all the facts. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, I guess closing out the the more formal part here before we uh, open up to the audience uh, and then open for comments. Um, based on what you've seen in terms of this, the results coming back, you know, what are what are some of the key takeaways for vendors? You know, particularly as we're about to sort of go into Q three, Q four. You know, what are they, what, you know, is there anything here that you say, look, it should really change your thinking or go in a certain direction or make sure you take, you know, some of these things into account? You know, how, what are the te practical takeaways for some of the vendors that are tuning into this episode? Yeah, 100%. So I think if you're starting from the beginning of our kind of webinar, then if you're standing in front of the decision of, okay, should I branch out from the vendor central model and go all into 3P or a hybrid uh, model? Um, make sure that you really run the business case and, I, I say this because I've seen multiple times now that vendors are kind of creating or brands are creating a P&L comparison um, with the status of today. And this is a little bit of a risk because, of course, you know, hopefully your kind of per unit economics inside out in your vendor central model. But if you are trying to move to 3P, then there are a lot of hidden cost components that you will need to factor in going forward because all of a sudden you need to kind of have software that helps you with the pricing. You need to have software that helps you with your inventory management, um, which is all done right now via your vendor central business. And you may also need to purchase external expertise or internalize them at a cost, which you may lack right now in your organization. And those are the hidden cost components that you should certainly account for when comparing your P&Ls with each other. And you're also making the business case of whether you should open up a seller central account yourself or whether you want to kind of onboard a distributor or a third-party logistics provider if you're thinking about FBM instead of FBA to your business. So just make sure that you really compare all of those cost components like for like between both business models, but you also account for these hidden cost components such as internal and external expertise that you may need to acquire in order to be even able to, to run that business yourself. 
when it comes to vendor negotiations, I think we kind of discussed it in length, like make sure that especially those senior sales uh, director relationships or senior category leader relationships are in check. You know who they are, especially for European vendors. It becomes critical that you know who are the pan-European decision makers, so the regional decision makers and not the local market ones, because they may not actually be able to interfere or to kind of positively influence your negotiations after all. And mm -hmm. I think those are the key learnings that I would take away from right now. Of course, make sure that you are taking a very proactive approach to your negotiations, which can also help you to facilitate the kind of negotiation speed, um, which is certainly something that also when you look at it from a um, resource investment point of view of your own headcount and your own teams should be something that you're favoring. Thank you, Martin. Um, now, we do have some great questions coming in. Um, we're already past half an hour, but uh, let's see if we can quickly cover some of them. Sure. Um, they're not coming through the through the platform here, so I'm going to read them out uh, myself. Um, I want to start, you know, Matt Parkinson asked this almost at the start of the, uh, the webinar. Um, Matt asked, I think, a very interesting question. Um, how can you implement a price increase without an Amazon vendor manager? Slightly, uh, slightly off topic, but I think a very pertinent question uh, for many uh, that are tuning in today. Yeah, 100%. I think we had a similar question our last webinar, haven't we? Um, so look, it's a little bit more challenging, but not impossible. Uh, what you really need to look at is your ASP compression. So you need to take a look at how your average selling price of your item and that you want to increase the cost price with. And your account has hopefully improved over the last three to six months compared to your average cost per unit. So how much have your cost prices increased over the last three to six months compared to your ASP? If you see that your ASP is going up because you're also seeing it reflected in the wider market segment, and of course, chances of getting it accepted are a little bit higher, also algorithmically, because Amazon has much more margin to play with than if you try to simply kind of increase your cost prices with Amazon at the same time as with any other retailer. Amazon is a self-proclaimed price follower, so they want to see those prices reflected in the market segment before they will accept any cost increase. Um, you go through two routes in order to kind of um, effectively demand or kind of require this cost increase. A, via the um, typical cost increase uh, workflow. Uh, this is just a standardized process that you have available in Vendor Central to adapt cost prices. It may get automatically rejected. And if so, you're always well advised to also separately raise a case where you make your yeah, business case and you kind of explain why this cost increase is justified um, and hopefully also reflected um, in the wider kind of P&L um, of the account. Of course, pricing is at the entire prerogative of the retailer. Um, so we'll have to see what Amazon does, does in the individual business case um, and on the individual account. But um, this should give you the best chances of getting it accepted. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, it's probably the last one looking at the clock here. Uh, one from Richard. Thank you, Richard, for your question. Um, his question is, what would you consider, Martin, to be the most ideal timing within a year, within the year to actually start the negotiation or the annual negotiation process? Is there an optimal time uh, during the year? Well, so they're always cyclical. Um, you can negotiate off cycle uh, with Amazon if you want to and if you are large enough of a brand in any given category. So you can request that. Um, but Amazon is not very likely to simply and outright accept it because they also have to kind of align their internal resources. Um, we all know Amazon had layoffs, so they have less vendor managers covering a similar or even higher number of accounts. Um, typically, vendor negotiations start in consumer goods categories around Q4. And then if you go into hardlines categories, such as consumer electronics, home housewares, kitchen, major domestic appliances, around um, the first quarter, so somewhere in early January. And it really depends on how important you are to them on whether they prioritize your account. So the earlier they start negotiating with you in the past, the more it indicates that you're also an important or more important brand to them. If you want to forward uh, the negotiation process, then you will certainly be able to kind of request that. Um, and the kind of number one tactic that I can give you is to simply cancel your trade terms um, three months um, before they kind of auto renew, which will not necessarily force but prompt your vendor manager to prioritize the negotiation on your account because they have no guarantee that 
they will continue to having terms, trading terms in place should they uh, start negotiations with you too late. It's interesting. Cancel, hit the cancel button to get their attention. Uh, some really good uh, nuggets there and, and really practical uh, advice there, Martin. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, as always, it's an absolute pleasure. You are a wealth of knowledge when uh, it comes to Amazon vendor negotiations. Um, before you go, I was going to ask you, do you have any plans to repeat this survey uh, in the future to get some time series behind this? It'd be very interesting. Yeah, sure. I mean, first and foremost, thanks so much for having me uh, on the show, Paul. It's always a pleasure to come back and to kind of bring uh, the newest insights um, to you and your audience. Um, so look, the survey results were quite interesting, right? But I think they will really become even more interesting if we can compare like for like how have certain priorities shifted over the years? So what I'm planning right now is to kind of conduct this survey on an annual basis going forward. Um, if anyone in the audience wants to participate or has missed their chance to participate this year, um, just kind of go to consultors.com, take a look at um, the current survey results. At the bottom of it, you'll find an opt-in to my newsletter where you'll stay up to date. And I'll obviously um, let you know once the new kind of um, survey opens. Expect it to be around... April, May next year, because this is the good time when most of the brands have concluded their annual vendor negotiations. Um, so that's the reason why we'll not be doing it by the end of this or early next year right away. Uh, but typically in the sweet spot between April and May, we are going to conduct it again. So looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, hope to be back uh, to bring you the newest results um, latest then. Definitely would, would love to have you on the, on the show again and look at where things have shifted, priorities and, and outcomes. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much, man. I do appreciate it. And I look forward to our next session. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for having me. Thank you. All right, everyone. That is a wrap for today. Um, just a small plug. Next week on, uh, I think it's Wednesday, we are running another Amazon vendor-focused uh, session, this time around with Asha from uh, Ethiopia. And we're going to be talking specifically about AVS, Amazon Vendor Services. Some of you are paying... Amazon a lot of money. Others have shied away from doing that. We're going to go deep into what is it? Uh, should you pay for it? Is it worth it? And if you are uh, paying for that service, how do you get the most out of it? So make sure to check that out via LinkedIn or via our registration page on our website. That's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Take care.